you're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you all doing? Well, I was just a bit, I don't, I feel furious about it and I don't know why I am furious, but it's another run story, I'm afraid. I was out running this morning and there was someone running who I've never seen before. And I think I know everyone who lives in our area. So I think they were on holiday. We have a lot of tourists. But he was dressed in like full black professional running gear. Yes, OK, he looked, he looked like he knew what he was doing. But as I ran past, he looked at me and he went, well done, mate. And I thought, why are you saying well done, mate? I know I look like an asthmatic elephant when I run. I know that. It's not like I'm someone who's an Olympic winner and uh, he can recognise that star quality. But well done, mate. It's as if, you know, well done for getting out. I don't know. I think I'm just in a weird mood. I haven't had any biscuits in the last 24 hours and I think that's the problem. But yeah, well done, mate. No. No, I'm not having that. I'm going to just sit and read my book and ignore you. So there we go. But what books have I got to ignore him with today? Oh, some really good books. I have got Goddesses by Nina Milnes. And Nina's going to come on and tell us all about this fabulous book. Then Hokey Pokey by Kate Mascarenas. And Kate's going to come on and tell us all about this book. Some really good ones. And then I'm going to review The House Hunt by C.M. Ewan. Wait till you read that. Uh, None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell. Wow. And Just Another Missing Person by Gillian McAllister. How does Gillian write those books? I don't know. Anyway, as I say, some great books. But let's get started straight away on Goddesses by Nina Milnes. And let's read you the blurb on this one. Aisha and Yaz are working the stand-up circuit, clawing their way to success one set at a time. When Aisha inadvertently goes viral, her trajectory changes as she's welcomed into an exclusive group of activists, a sacred circle of change makers, each woman with a specific gift to contribute. The circle draws Yaz in too, and they are both invited to an intimate Hindu, except it's not a Hindu, it's a goddess retreat. While Aisha tries desperately to fit herself into a shape that the women will accept, Yaz treats the entire itinerary with open disdain. But the goddess retreat is no laughing matter and they'll need to stick together if they want to get out alive. I love it because it's described as well as bridesmaids meet get out. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Anyway, let's talk to Nina now. Well, it is my huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast today Nina Milnes, whose fabulous book is called Goddesses. Nina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Philippa. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to talk to you, but let's start in the way we always do. Please, can you summarise this great book for us? Absolutely. So Goddesses is about Aisha and Yaz, two women of colour who are comedians on the comedy circuit. And one day, one of Aisha's rants at a heckler goes viral and she finds herself drawn into this very privileged, elite group of women activists. And she thinks this is absolutely brilliant. She's stoked. This is her chance to make something of herself and really belong somewhere. But Yaz isn't impressed by them at all. And they get invited to the Hindu of one of these women, except they're not allowed to call it a Hindu. It's a goddess retreat and it's in a mansion in the middle of nowhere. And it's full of strange rituals and weird behaviour that gets weirder and weirder until they find themselves running for their lives. Well, if anyone hasn't run out and immediately acquired the book on the basis of that, I (laughs) don't know. But can you read us the first few lines? Are you going to read us the whole prologue, I think? I am, yes. I'm going to jump straight into the prologue. Fantastic. Aisha kept low and crept slowly around the lake, making sure to keep the others exactly on the opposite side. She moved when they moved, her soaking body trembling uncontrollably, her teeth chattering violently. She tried to calm her panicked breathing and keep herself concealed in the darkness of the country night. 
When they were just over a quarter of the way around, there was a chilling scream of triumph. Aisha froze. Her stomach sank. She could just make out the silhouette of a finger against the night sky pointed directly at her. A beam of cold light locked onto her, then another. Someone ululated. More voices joined in, and then they ran at her. Aisha pelted away back into the thick dark of the forest, but they were much closer now. Two figures sprinted with intense determination in Aisha's direction. She didn't need to look behind her. She felt their intent and heard their rhythmic breathing as they closed in on her. What would happen when they caught her? How far would they go? She had no idea anymore where the line was. She knew they weren't fully themselves, but even as themselves, she was now terrified of what they were. How had she got them so wrong? How could Yaz do that? Join them? Help them hurt her? Surely there was some mistake. She thought of turning, trying to reason with them, snap them out of this savage intoxication, but she didn't dare slow down. Instinct told her to keep running, maybe for her life. Oh, Nina, that was <laughs> that was great. I dread to ask what gave you the idea for this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, it all happened exactly five years ago when I went for a, a meeting with my agents at the time about something completely different. I didn't write books. I started off writing you know, short bits of comedy and and theatre plays. But they asked me that day how my weekend had been. And I said, well, it was a bit weird. I went to this goddess retreat. It was a Hindu, but we weren't allowed to call it that. It was a goddess retreat. And it got weirder and weirder. And I started telling them about some of the things that happened. And they were like, oh, my God, this is a book. You have to write this. And I said, well, I don't write books. And they were like, well, yeah, this one you've got to write. And we're going to help you with that. Don't worry. Exaggerate it. Turn it into a thriller. Make sure someone dies and we can sell this. So five years later, with a lot of trial and error, we had goddesses. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so are people scared to invite you away for holidays, trips and parties for fear of what might happen? I'm sure. I, yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't know, but I'm sure <laughs> that I've lost out on quite a lot of invitations <laughs> since then, just because I've turned people into demonic killers. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you tell us a bit more? With no spoilers, can you tell us a bit more about the main characters? Yeah, well, the protagonist is Aisha and she's this woman of colour. She's she's half Middle Eastern and she's kind of grafting and desperately trying to make something of herself on the comedy circuit, which we know is already difficult anyway. But if you're a woman and then if you're working class and then if you're a person of colour, you know, you kind of start off at the very bottom of the, the comedy ladder, shall we say. And uh, it's been really tricky. And and her best friend, Yaz, is somebody who's much more confident and is really smashing it and going places. And she's not very easily impressed by, you know, these women. But Aisha so desperately wants to belong somewhere. And she's got all these aspirations, just but just feels like she's been, you know, just knocking on the door for years and years and not being allowed in. And so that makes her quite vulnerable to these women who then kind of, yeah, decide that she's allowed into their kind of elite group. And I just wanted to show how class and maybe race can really play a part in how people feel, you know, in these groups and who gets to speak out and tell their story and have a platform and be the face of a movement and who doesn't. So, yeah, and then you've got all these brilliant other characters who make up this elite group of of activists <laughs> like Frankie and Clemmy and India, who I had lots of fun writing. And how did you manage the storyline for it? Because you'd already experienced it, was it quite easy to to plot it and pace it? So it was a lot of trial and error because it was the first time I was writing a book and I was so lucky to just have the support that I needed. And that came from my agent at the time, who was absolutely brilliant and really held my hand through the process. But also my peers, you know, I've got an amazing group of writers that feed back on all sorts of rubbish I I send them. And it's just brilliant notes and they really care about we're very invested in each other's projects you know so I know that anything that comes from them really is for the best of the project they want it to be as good as possible 
So I remember that my first draft was 40,000 words, which is nothing, you know, a book's meant to be at least double that. And I sent it away to my agent and she said, well, okay, that's a good start. But, you know, you might want to expand on it. And I said, what? There's no words left. There's 40,000 of them. There's nothing more to say. And she kind of pointed out that it read very much like a script, you know, with lots of dialogue and lots of action, but not much description or inner monologue or, or feelings or, you know, responses or anything like that. So yeah it was it was a real steep learning curve but what a privilege you know to be allowed to just make mistakes and get it wrong and figure it out and have people believe in what i was doing enough to kind of help me so you know we redrafted and redrafted and redrafted and finally after about 3 years we had something that was good enough to show people and we sent it out and yeah then all this happened. <laughs> and has it changed your view going forward? You know, if you have an idea now, are you more likely to pitch it as something to be on the screen or radio or as a book? Oh, that's a great question. I feel so lucky that I've been able to work in so many different mediums. And I really do feel that I'm learning still so much about how to write for audio, how to write plays for theatre, how to write books, and now, you know, moving into TV as well. And I've got so much respect for for the people that do it well and have really mastered those mediums because it's still such a process for me to kind of understand how to make the most of each one. So I guess what I'm finding happens now is that I have an idea and then I let it gestate for for a while, whatever that means, you know, and it kind of colours itself in and, you know, expands and, and you know, becomes a thing. And then I, I try to imagine what it would be like or what it would look like or sound like in the different mediums that I've had the, the privilege of working in. And then with my agents and, and you know, with, with my peers and, you know, the people that I trust, I kind of just figure out where it would sit best and then try to to pitch it and and you know write some kind of document you know that that would kind of then we can then send out to people obviously you know like focused on one particular medium and the tv rights have been sold for goddesses i believe which is fantastic yeah. have you said oh gosh i th- i think i know someone that could actually write the the script for this <laughs> Yes, obviously, I threw myself in the ring. It was a really interesting process. It, we were just so lucky. Like, you know, we, we, I had the most amazing meetings, first of all, just, just with publishers, you know, about the book deal. And it was very funny because when I, when I had finished writing that draft that we decided was good enough to put out, I kind of just booked a holiday. I was like, right, I'm out of here. And I assumed that it would take months and months for anyone to read it because that's how long it takes me to read a book. But a few days later, my agent kind of messaged me going, Nina, where are you? And I was like, well, I'm in Jamaica. And she was like, there's loads of people that want to talk to you. So we had to quickly like kind of, you know, throw everything on Zoom and have these meetings between Jamaica and London. And of course, that day, the internet on that side of the island went down. We couldn't find anywhere. We were like traipsing from one hotel to the other with my laptop in a tote bag, just desperately asking for some internet. And we finally found somewhere that let me kind of sit in the lobby and use it. And it was some of the most important meetings of my life. But yes, we we got the deal for Goddesses. And then soon after that, we were having meetings, you know, with, with TV companies, which was just amazing. And I was lucky enough to be able to kind of, you know, choose from a, a few of them. And I was offered the chance to write it myself. But I actually went with with an organisation who I love and respect and whose kind of body of work I, I've admired for ages, who said, look, you know, you can be exec producer and we would love to throw you in the mix. But to get the kind of deal that we want on the platform that we think this could be on, we're going to need some more experience in the room. And I had so much respect for that. 
that I said, yeah, I think I think that's the better choice. So this is where we are. We're building the team. We've got the most amazing writer. I can't say too much about who it is and what's going on, but it's in very good hands and I'm really excited about where it's going. Oh, I just love it. This is just such a special time for you. And hopefully, you know, it's just moving up and up and up. It's just your joy and excitement in, in the work is wonderful to hear about. Well, thank you, Philippa. It's a lot of hard work as well. I mean, we launched it a few weeks ago and I was like, right, you know, I'm so used to hustling that I basically just decided to hit as many bookshops as possible and just beg them to order it in. And I just leave lots of bookmarks on their counter. And that's what I've been trying to do, you know, because I've just used to hustling and hustling and, you know, just like Aisha, <laughs> you know, I'm just like, what can I do? I have to keep, you know, kind of making this happen. So I, I haven't really really stop to be honest <laughs> well I'm sorry you're having to work so hard but I think your enthusiasm will just show people the reason to pick up this book and what sets it apart but enough about that Nina we come to the crucial question here this is the most important one on this podcast and it is what biscuit was powering <laughs> the writing of goddesses yes I love this question and I've been fascinated by everyone else's answers that I've been hearing on, on the other episodes. So I'm one of those annoying people who doesn't have much of a sweet tooth. So I am fueled usually by lots and lots of crisps and the smellier the better. So <laughs> cheese and onion, prawn cocktail, you know, fake bacon smells, whatever it is, you know, it goes straight in. But I do want to give an honourable mention to Tim Tams, which are an Australian biscuit. And if you haven't had them, I recommend that you give it a go because they are, I'm pretty sure they put crack in it. It's that good. Like, <laughs> it's amazing. So if I was going to go that way, then it would be a Tim Tam. <laughs> and are those being consumed while you're typing? So if you turned your keyboard over, a, a <laughs> great deal of Tim Tams and Chris would emerge. Or are they a reward for when you finish the writing? Well, they start off as a reward, but obviously as I go on, you know, I go a bit feral. I try and, you know, desperately carve out like weeks where I go to a cottage, you know, and only, it only really happens like once or twice a year. But I, I go to a cottage somewhere in, in the countryside and just write and write and write. And that's when I stop showering and I start eating out of the fridge and there's crisps everywhere and biscuits everywhere. And yeah, so it depends. If I'm at home, I've got to behave myself. And then if I'm in my little cottage where no one else is going to see me for seven days, then yeah, all bets are off. Rules are out the window. <laughs> so if we see a lorry backing up and a large quantity of Tim Tams and Chris, Smelly Chris being delivered, we know you're in isolation and, and <laughs> the words are going to get written. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just great to talk to you and hear more about goddesses. And I just can't wait to hear people's reactions as they read it as well. Nina Milnes, thank you so much. Thank you, Philippa. Coming up, one more author interview and more book reviews. So next we have Hokey Pokey by Kate Mascarenas. Let me read you the blurb of this one. February 1929. The Regent Hotel in Birmingham is a place of deception and glamour. Behind its six-storied facade, guests sip absinthe cocktails on velvet banquets while the staff navigate the hotel's labyrinthine service passageways to ensure they are always at hand. In the early evening, psychoanalyst Nora Dickinson checks in under a false name. It's unlike Nora to deceive, her aversion to lying borders on the pathological, but she's travelling with an agenda. Having shadowed the famous opera singer Berenice Oxbow from Zurich, she's determined not to lose sight of her now. But when a terrible snowstorm isolates the hotel and its guests from the outside world, reality appears to shift. Nora's grip loosens and the nightmares she's worked hard to control begin to bare their teeth. Very good. Let's go and talk to Kate now. Well, it is my huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast today Kate Mascarenas to talk to us about her wonderful book, Hokey Pokey. Kate, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Philippa. It's really nice to talk to you. It's lovely to talk to you. Can you start? Now, we don't want any spoilers, but can you start by giving us a summary of this yeah, book? Yeah, of course. So Hokey Pokey is set in 1929. It's a horror story that has elements of golden age crime. 
And it begins with a character called Nora, who's a psychoanalyst, and she's following across Europe a very notorious opera singer. And the reasons why are somewhat mysterious. But she follows her to a luxury hotel in Birmingham and a snowstorm starts up. They're cut off from everybody and guests start going missing. So that's that's the sort of central mystery of the book is what exactly is going on and how does it relate to Nora's past? Can I trouble you to read us a first few sentences of this yes, of book? Course. Nora was not a liar by nature. She was blessed with a prodigious skill for mimicry. If she chose, she could open her mouth and repeat every word she had ever heard verbatim in the style it was first spoken. Because of this ability, she saw herself as truthful. She was a recorder of truth, as true as any phonograph. What a great opening to a great story. Can you tell us a bit more about the main characters that we'll come across as we read this book? Yeah, so so Nora is a person who almost completely, actually, the, the, it's, the, talk, the story is told from her perspective. There are little bits where, because it's set in a hotel, you do sort of have moments of sort of just pulling out and having almost like a God's eye view of, of everything that's happening in there. But for the most part, we're really sticking with her perspective. And as, you know, as possibly comes across from that paragraph, she has a very clear idea of herself as somebody who's quite principled and quite truthful. But actually, in practice, she does quite a lot of... She, she can be quite misleading and, you know, she, she misleads the reader a little bit as well. She's fairly unusual in that she is a woman working in a field, psychoanalysis, that's mostly made of men. One of the nice things about writing this is I'm not sure how aware people are really that in the 1920s there were women working as psychoanalysts at all. And in fact, there were, there were there were quite a you know there were quite a number of them, even though they were in the minority. So that was so that was something that was really nice to explore when I was researching the book. She is somebody who has a very complicated past, including some some quite sort of traumatic things that have have happened to her. And you know that's that sort of feeds into to her motivations a lot of the time. And we need to talk about the cover, the gorgeous cover of this book. Wow, Thank we. You. Were you involved or was it just a complete shock when you first saw it? So, yeah, so generally speaking, I mean, because this is my third book and I've actually had the same cover designer for each one for, for the UK. And, I mean, she's done a brilliant job with, with all three of them. But what normally happens is I get asked to fill out a form right at the very beginning where, you know, I'll say what I think the main things are, whether there's actually any kind of visual elements in the story that might make a nice cover. So I get the opportunity to suggest some things. And, uh, you know, the, the the publisher sort of takes that and obviously they, they have their ideas, as you know, as to how it's going to be positioned, you know, in the bookshop and everything else that they factor in. And so, so they'll, they liaise with the designer. And what then happens is I, I really come back in at the very end of the process when they've had a lot of discussion and looked at various different options. And I kind of see the, the, the sort of ones that are, you know, the one that's been discussed and that's almost at the very end. And so, so when I saw this one, it was pretty much as it is now. I, you know, the, in terms of the foiling, I was told it was before, would be foiled, but you do see it as a PDF. So, you know, you don't, you don't actually get like the full sparkly effect <laughs> until, until you see it on the shelves. But I think it really, it, it captures really nicely that, that kind of Art Deco aesthetic that, you know, you associate with, with a luxury hotel from, the, from that period. So I was, I was really pleased with it in that, in that regard, yeah. Yeah, I just think it's stunning. And there's even a cocktail recipe inside yes. as well. well. That's an authentic recipe. And I haven't actually tried it, but I mean, I, I, I've spoken to a couple of people who have. And they said, firstly, that it's lethal. <laughs> they're not entirely sure, they're entirely sure it's that drinkable, but it is an authentic. I got it from a little 1920s hotel. It's one of the things, one of the menus that I found when I was doing research in sort of various libraries and archives. That was one of the one of the things that I learned. And I thought, oh, that's perfect. So, so I used it, but I don't know how drinkable it is. <laughs> So it should come with a warning in itself. Yeah. <laughs> it's a book of layers. Was that always your plan when you started writing it? Yeah, generally speaking. So my approach to writing is a pain, actually, because <laughs> I, I don't plan, I don't outline. It doesn't work for me. 
I generally have an image, like a visual image in my head. I have like a starting point. I maybe have a couple of characters. In this particular case, the image that I started with, it was a kitchen where they were preparing food and they were cutting a piece of meat and a piece of meat had a tattoo on it. So that was the image that, that I, you know, I thought, okay, what's the story with this? And I just write until I know what the story is. I, I find my way as I go. So what I would say is that the layers were in there from the first draft. And it does move around a little bit. It starts in Birmingham. Also, there's a section that takes place in Warwickshire where Nora is a child in the woods where she grew up. And there's also a substantial section that's set in Zurich where she trained as a psychoanalyst. So it it sort of moves around a little bit as well in sort of place and in time slightly. That's really interesting. So you you get a vision or an idea of a scene mm. and then you just write it until the book presents yeah. itself so are you just writing and, and letting the story tell you what's happening yes pretty much and what it means is that my first draft is often barely coherent <laughs> <laughs> and what I have to do is trust that some sense will emerge through the process of editing and also just we are you know as humans we are pattern seeking it's actually very hard for us to you know to produce anything at length that doesn't have a narrative thread in it so if you try to write complete nonsense for, for 60,000 words, there is going to be a story that, that comes through. So some of it's, I actually I tend to think of it as a zero draft, actually, rather than a first draft, that, that, that sort of first sort of one that I do, because it isn't, it isn't anything that I could share with anybody. It's not, it's not a shareable level, but it's where I find out what the story is I'm telling. And it's interesting when I talk to other writers actually about their own processes and, you know, I know that some people who are very sort of organised planners and they're like their outline might be sort of 40,000 to 50,000 words. And I think, well, that's actually not so different from my zero draft in that case. And sometimes I wonder how much the differences are really to do with semantics, you know, that, that, that maybe what we're doing is more similar than, than we're describing it as, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does. And I love the, the phrase zero draft because yeah. that is a, a great way of putting it. So you are someone who prefers editing to plotting. I don't mind thinking about plot in a diagnostic way. Once I've actually got my sort of body of, of words down on the page, I'm quite happy to think about sort of plot and structure and all of those and all of those different aspects. What I don't like doing is outlining. <laughs> I don't like I don't I hate writing a synopsis as well. I don't think that's terribly unusual. <laughs> but those two things, I think sort of trying to condense Anything into sort of a, a small chunk just brings me out in hives. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you manage the plot and the, the various sort of storylines in this book? Was it something that, you, you know, did you have bits of paper stuck on walls or did, was it all in I your mind? Yeah, I tend not to stick them on walls, but what I, I always have like a notebook on me. And I will sort of create little, I will write timelines within that so that I can keep track of where I am. And the other thing that I do is that I, I will note down questions in there that that I think need to be answered and that I haven't quite resolved yet, you know, at, at successive stages of drafting. One of the really nice things about doing that in a notebook for me is that if I'm feeling really stuck and thinking like, what on earth am I doing with this? How am I going to get out of this hole? It's really nice to actually be able to turn the pages and think, I solved all of these other problems. <laughs> you know, I'll solve these as well. So th there's, there's a kind of motivational aspect to me doing it that way too. That makes sense. Yeah. When you were writing Hokey Pokey, which was the best word to write, the first word or the last word? The last. <laughs> Definitely the last. I mean, I like the first word. Interestingly, the opening, the section that I just read and the last paragraph changed very little between the zero draft and the final draft. So those those two things were always were always sort of their bookending the rest of the story. But yeah, in terms of, you know, actually get you know typing getting typing those last few lines and then the end <laughs> that was very nice yeah. with the book being set in sort of 1929 around that time were you listening to music of that time as you were writing or did you have to write in silence it depends what stage I'm at so I didn't I actually I didn't listen to specifically set out to listen to music from that period I did listen to some opera Bernice, the, the the sort of the character that that Nora is following, she she sings opera. So, so I was listening to uh, arias that she would have sung. But quite often, if I am 
if I'm doing something really naughty, anything with words in, I find distracting. So mm. I either prefer to do that in silence or if I'm somewhere where there's ambient noise, that's okay. You know, I, I actually work quite well in cafes as long as it's kind of below a level that's not going to distract me. If I'm kind of in full flow and, you know, I know what I've got to do and I'm just going through and doing it, then I can, I can listen to music more easily. So it just sort of depends what stage I'm at, really, of the, of the writing process. Yeah. So when we hear different music playing in your house, we know what we can tell what stage yes. a book is. <laughs> I listen to quite a lot of electronic dance music, but I mean, that's because there isn't, you know, often there's no words to it and it's quite rhythmic. So it allows me to get, you know, I can, I have something pleasant to listen to, but I'm not getting distracted. You know, it's not interfering with the actual putting the sentences. In. <laughs> of yeah. course, but not quite of the era that the book's no. <laughs> based <laughs> I mean, you've been a copywriter, a doll's house maker, a bookbinder, chartered psychologist. Did yeah. any or all of that go into this book? So, I mean, there are obviously, there are some psychological themes insofar as Nora, you know, trained to to be a doctor of the mind, you know, as that was in, in 1929. And, you know, that's, I am interested in that, in that history of psychoanalysis. It doesn't really, it doesn't bear much resemblance to what I would have covered in my undergraduate degree in psychology or what I studied at doctoral level. And I think there's also... It's kind of because it's it's a gothic horror, really, and you you know I, I was also writing with an awareness of particular tropes and what doctors and what you know if you think about like the Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal Lecter, we have like an idea of sort of monstrous therapists. It's it's really interesting actually how many compared to sort of other caring professions, I think it's really interesting how few positive literary representations of therapists there are. And, and mine kind of fits in to sort of that trope. And, you know, and I think there are, there are a number of possible reasons why sort of they, they get represented in that particular way. But it isn't really, I, I don't think it's anything to do with people's real life experience of, of therapists or anything that I might have encountered sort of while, you know, while studying psychology. It's that, that they're quite a handy symbol of certain things that people like to talk about in stories. That makes sense. Well, we come to the final question, which is the most important one on this podcast, Kate. So please prepare yourself. And that is what biscuit powered the writing of Hokey Pokey? What was your biscuit of choice? Gosh, there's, there's so many possibilities. <laughs> I actually, what I like to do, I, I don't tend to eat while I'm writing, but if I, I like to have a little reward. So having some baklava is really nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if I if I finish something that you know I've met my goal for the day, then that's my little cheat afterwards. I can say yes, I've done a good job. Here's my reward. <laughs> so do you have it sitting there and you look at it longingly while you're typing away? I have to. I actually have to go out and get it because I would. I've got no impulse control. I would <laughs> eat it. So it's like if, if I actually have to go out and buy it. Then, you know. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, it's just great to talk to you about Hokey Pokey. Kate Mascarenas, thank you so much. Thank you, Philippa. It was lovely to talk to you. Excellent. Well, we must move on to The House Hunt by C.M. Ewan. Let me read you the blurb on this book. Wow, what a book. Oh, I'm just caught up in my headphone cable. Here we are. Your dream buyer or your worst nightmare? Your estate agent calls. She's running late and needs you to show a man around your home. You let him in and begin the tour, but something about him feels wrong. You ask him to leave and he refuses. Then he tells you something about you, something inconceivable. And then you realise he doesn't want your house. He wants you. Shall we do the first sentence? Let's go to that immediately. Well, there's the first thing is a voicemail message, but I'm not going to read that. I'm going to read chapter one. Paranoia stalks me when I'm vacuuming the house and Sam is out. I get spooked that I'm not alone, convinced a stranger is creeping up on me when my back is turned. My spine prickles. I tense and then I turn. I always turn. I loved this book. I love C.M. Ewan's writing. They are delivered at a pace, these books. They are your literal page turners. 
I'm always surprised about where the story goes. There's always twists and turns. I just think they are great. They are just ones that if you want a book that just immediately, woof, you're in the story and you're, you know, it's not a slow burn, put it like that. I think they're really good and I really enjoyed The House Hunt. So that was that one. Now let's go on to none of this. Sorry, get a piece of paper. None of this is true by Lisa Jewell. I listened to this on audiobook and I loved it. Here is the blurb. Celebrating her 45th birthday at her local pub, podcaster Alex Summer crosses paths with an unassuming woman called Josie Fair. Josie is also celebrating her 45th. A few days later, they bump into each other again, this time outside Alex's children's school. Josie says she thinks she would be an interesting subject for Alex's podcast. She is, she tells Alex, on the cusp of great changes in her life. Alex agrees to a trial interview. And indeed, Josie's life appears to be strange and complicated. Alex finds her unsettling, but can't quite resist the temptation to keep digging. Slowly, Alex starts to realise that Josie has been hiding some very dark secrets. And before she knows it, Josie has cajoled her way into Alex's life and into her home. Soon, Alex begins to wonder who Josie Fair really is and what has she done. Well, let me read you the first few sentences. This is from the prologue. Stumbling from the cool of the air-conditioned hotel foyer into the steamy white heat of the night does nothing to sober him up. It makes him feel panicky and claustrophobic. A sweat that feels like pure alcohol blooms quickly on his skin, dampening his spine and the small of his back. How can it be so hot at three in the morning? And where is she? Where is she? He turns to see if the girl is behind him and sees her wishy-washy, wavy-wavy, in double vision through the glass windows of the hotel. And then he sees a car indicate to pull over and his heart rate starts to slow. She's here. At last, thank God, this terrible night is coming to an end. He squints to bring it into focus, to search the driver's seat for the reassuring gleam of her white blonde hair. But it's not there. The window winds down and he recalls slightly. Well, I really enjoyed it. I I thought it was brilliant. It was well paced. There were surprises. There were revelations. You know, you know, you know, things aren't good, but you don't know why and you don't know what's going to happen. Um, but keep listening, keep going and you'll be surprised. Yes, None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell. And then the last book today is Just Another Missing Person by Gillian McAllister. Uh, I was hoping to get Gillian on again to talk to us about this book, but it was not to be. But never mind. Let me read you the blurb on this one. Olivia, 22 years old, last seen on CCTV entering a dead end alley and not coming back out again. Missing for one day and counting. Julia is the detective heading up the case. She knows what to expect. A desperate family, a ticking clock and long hours away from her husband and daughter. But Julia has no idea how close to home it's going to get. Because there's a man out there and his weapon isn't a gun or a knife. It's a secret, her worst one. He tells her that her family's safety depends on one thing. Julia must not find out what happened to Olivia and must frame somebody else for her murder. What would you do? (laughs) Right, let's do the prologue of this. Julia knew from the way Genevieve rushed towards her that something was wrong. She burst through the door of the multi-storey car park, let it swing behind her, a hasty, chaotic slam that pounded the walls. Julia shouldn't have let her go alone. That was her first thought. She'd taken a work call and Genevieve went to pay for their ticket by herself. And now... Mum! Genevieve shouted, crossing quickly towards her. She looked haunted, white under the strip lights, eyeliner smudged, eyes panicked, her gaze darting back over her shoulder. Dread began to churn in Julia's stomach. She could feel her pulse everywhere, in her hands, her legs, her shoulders, her body's siren call. Something's wrong. Something's wrong, thudded her heartbeat. And then Genevieve indicated, with a blood-stained hand behind her, you need to come. Well, that's an opening, isn't it? You can't 
you can't listen to that prologue and not want to pick up the book, I don't think. I think that's just a, a great opener. I listened to it as an audio book. I loved it. Gillian just is the, the goddess of twists and turns. She really is. And just as you're thinking, oh, I know what this book is all about. I know what's happening. Wham, you're surprised, you're shocked. You haven't. You were wrong. It's completely different. I just love her writing and I uh, think she's very accomplished. And Gillian's had a baby. And I honestly thought that when she's had this baby, she would be like, oh, that's it. I can't write anymore. You know, I found looking after a baby incredibly hard. And yet she's just delivering. She's just delivering brilliant books all the time. It's quite galling, really, that she can do that. It just shows how dedicated she is to the craft and how good an author she is. So, yes. Bravo. So those are your books. Let's just have a quick recap on the books we've covered today. We've looked at The Wonderful Goddesses by Nina Milnes and Nina very kindly joined us to talk about that book. We've looked at Hokey Pokey by Kate Muscarenas and Kate very kindly joined us as well. We've had The House Hunt by C.M. Ewan. We've had None of This is True by Lisa Jewell and Just Another Missing Person by Gillian McAllister. Those are your books. I'm gone. I'm going to send you on your way. I'll be back on Friday with a short five questions in five minutes episode. Other than that, just look after yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one ever. See you again soon. <laughs>